Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And uh, it's a privilege uh, and an honor to be back once again uh, to speak on behalf of uh, Ligonier and uh, the National uh, Conference and uh, to uh, renew my uh, fellowship and uh, friendship uh, with Dr. R.C. Spruill. Uh, I was uh, at a different conference earlier this week uh, giving a lecture on something rather abstruse and uh, one of the lecturers uh, in that conference uh, at the beginning of his talk and in the middle of his talk and at the end of his talk was uh, citing uh, from uh, Dr. Spruill. And as I was listening to the lecture, uh, I thought to myself, uh, once again, uh, the vast uh, and significant uh, and ever-increasing importance of uh, Dr. Spruill's uh, ministry as a defender uh, of the faith uh, in our generation. And uh, I, for one, and I know all of you, are deeply grateful to God for His continued ministry. Uh, and mention of uh, defender of the faith uh, reminds me uh, my, my beloved dog, uh, Jake, who I've mentioned from this uh, platform before on several occasions, uh, died uh, last June, and uh, miss him very much, and thank you, uh, those of you who have asked about him. Uh, but there is, uh, there is another uh, who is now called Luther. <laughs> uh, he is, uh, like his namesake, uh, a tad rambunctious and uh, a defender of things, usually a hole uh, that he digs in the ground. <laughs> now, I'm under authority and under instruction, and uh, my title uh, is uh, Saving uh, the World. We began this morning, uh, those of you who are able to be here first thing this morning, and uh, we were uh, given a, an extraordinary uh, insight uh, into the life of uh, Athanasius, uh, Athanasius contra mundum, uh, Athanasius uh, against the world and uh, defending the truth of the gospel against a hostile world. Uh, and then I, I thought I had, I had done with following Sinclair Ferguson. Uh, I, I was his uh, lackey and assistant uh, in uh, First Presbyterian Church in Columbia uh, for two years before, before succeeding him as senior minister, so I know all too well what it's like to preach after uh, Dr. Ferguson uh, and after that uh, tour de force uh, that we were given uh, this morning. Uh, addressing Philippians uh, chapter 2. Uh, now, my text is an altogether different text, so uh, it's good that you've had a break uh, and you've bought some books and uh, increased your credit debt or whatever you've done in the last uh, half an hour because uh, our, our mood uh, changes uh, significantly. Uh, the text that I was assigned is in Genesis 18, and if you would turn with me, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis 18. I'm going to pick it up uh, at the 16th verse. Uh, let's, uh, let's remind ourselves of a context here, three, uh, three individuals, three men, uh, of whom one uh, is the Lord. Uh, and that becomes apparent uh, in uh, the reading uh, that we're about to read together, that two of the men uh, depart, but the Lord uh, stands in Abraham's uh, presence, presence. This is one of these uh, theophanies uh, in the Old Testament where God uh, appears in human-like form in what we might call loosely a, a pre-incarnate uh, uh, manifestation uh, of God in uh, a way and a form that uh, is appropriate uh, to uh, human beings and to uh, Abraham 
uh, in particular. And uh, there has been uh, an, a meal uh, that has been shared in the tents uh, of, uh, near the oaks of Mamre, uh, and uh, Abraham and Sarah have been reminded of the covenant uh, that God has entered into with Abraham, part of which was the promise that they would bear a son. Uh, there is a significant problem, uh, and uh, Moses is aware uh, of the biology as well as you. This is not a 2014 uh, issue that we understand so much better now, given advances in um, medicine and so on. Uh, the problem is that Abraham is 100 years old and uh, Sarah is, uh, is 90. And uh, we won't go into all of the issues, uh, but um, uh, conceiving a, a, a child, uh, procreating and conceiving a child when you are a hundred and she is ninety, uh, was as difficult in this period as it would be now. And uh, uh, Sarah uh, has laughed uh, when she overhears uh, from somewhere outside the tent. Uh, the reminder of this promise that actually had been given in the 17th chapter, it's a, an indication uh, that the grace of God uh, is not only being manifested to Abraham, but is also being uh, manifested to uh, Sarah. So in verse 16, uh, there is a segue, and this is the Word of God. Then the men set out from there, and they looked down toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them to set them on their way. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I have chosen him, that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me, and if not, I will know." So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood still before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, "'Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are fifty righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the fifty righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do? what is just. And the Lord said, if I find at Sodom fifty righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered and said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the fifty righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find forty-five there. Again he spoke to him and said, Suppose forty are found there. He answered, For the sake of forty I will not do it. Then he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Suppose thirty are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find thirty there. He said, Behold, 
I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose twenty are found there. He answered, For the sake of twenty I will not destroy it. Then he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak again, but this once. Suppose ten are found there. He answered, For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went His way when He had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Father, as we consider together this portion of Scripture, men wrote as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. No prophecy is of human origin. We thank You that all Scripture is given by the outbreathing of God and is profitable for doctrine and reproof and correction and instruction in the way of righteousness, that the man of God might be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Help us to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest, and all for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, God reveals to Abraham His covenant child, son in the faith, His purpose with regard to Sodom and Gomorrah. God shares this with Abraham. Abraham is to be made into a great nation who at this point in biblical redemptive history has no heirs. God is, God is going to make him a great nation. In him and through him the nations of the world will be blessed. God comes in blessing. God comes in grace. But there is also another issue, another feature of the character and person and attribute of God, and that is His holiness. He has heard the outcry of Sodom, whether it's the righteous who have cried to Him about Sodom or whether He has heard Sodom itself cry out. I want us to see three things here this morning, and our goal is to ask the question, what is God's intention for the city? What is God's intention for the city, saving the city, saving the world? And what is Abraham's place in it? And the first thing I want us to see here is the obligation or perhaps in the plural, the obligations of the covenant Lord, the obligations laid upon Abraham to the covenant Lord. Look at verse 19. I have chosen him. God in His sovereignty, God in His grace has come to Abraham drawn him from Ur of the Chaldees, a, a worshiper of idols. Abram was an idolater, a sacrifice to idols, and God has come to him. And God has come to him in blessing. God has come to him in grace. God has entered into a covenant with him and with his wife and with a promised progeny. 
that would spread to the nations of the world. I have chosen you, or some of your translations, I have known you. It's an act of sovereignty. It's an act of divine monogism. This is not a cooperation on the part of Abraham and God. This is not Abraham having entered into some kind of, of, of treaty with God. Uh, I, I give fifty and you give fifty. This is, this is entirely from beginning to end an act of divine, sovereign monogism. It's grace to the undeserving. It is grace to the sinner. Underlined in the prequel to this passage that we are looking at in the laughter of Sarah. But there is also not just grace, but there is command. Look at verse 19 again, I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. There is a, a symbiotic relationship here between the graciousness of God to Abraham and the obligations of Abraham to that covenant into which God has entered with His servant. He has responsibilities. He has obligations. Now, I know… I know we speak about an unconditional love of God and in defending the doctrine of justification by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. It is imperative that we do not allow in any way or shape or form anything of us to besmirch and dilute the absolute graciousness of God in our justification. But there are obligations to our justification. We are justified by faith alone, but that faith that justifies is never alone. It is always accompanied by works, the Westminster divine said. And I think you see that here. That having entered into this covenant relationship with Abraham, there are now incumbent upon Abraham as the covenant servant in this relationship, there are incumbent upon him obligations. Uh, one of the issues, uh, prevailing issues, and it's nothing new, of course, one of the things we learned this morning about studying Athanasius, that there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, what goes around comes around, or what comes around goes around. Every heresy has been around in some form or another in the past. If you don't know your history, you're doomed to repeat it and so on. It's amazing how many blogs I read as though, as though somebody has just seen something that no one has ever seen before. And of course, if we're ignorant of church history, we might be delusional enough to think that that is true. Uh, but one of the issues uh, with which we uh, contend uh, today is the relationship between law and gospel, or the relationship between gospel and law, grace and law, covenant and obligation. And it's right here in the text. I have chosen you, but you have obligations, you have duties. There are things that you now need to do. I, I brought you into this relationship entirely by grace, by an act of divine sovereign monogism, but there are obligations now. Now, there are those, uh, and I meet them uh, fairly frequently, uh, that as soon as you mention the word command, or as soon as you mention the idea of ought or obligation or duty, the L word is going to come out. You know what the L word is. The L word is legalism. Am I, as a covenant child, am I 
as one who is in a saving relationship with God the Father through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone by the indwelling and fullness of the Holy Spirit, am I under obligation? Well, if you hesitate to answer that question, you are already sunk. <laughs> there is what uh, John Calvin calls uh, the third use of the law. There is the use of the law as a pedagogue. There is the use of the law as a kind of, as a kind of stick to beat us with to show us our sinfulness and our wretchedness and to drive us to an end of ourselves and to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as He is freely offered to us in the gospel. There is the use of the law in, in, in civil code and in civil life. And then there's the third use of the law, the use of the law as moral and perpetual obligation on the part of the covenant child, on the part of the justified sinner to live out that faith in compliance with the beautiful and wondrous law of God so that Christians justified by faith alone can say, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation day and night, and when I see law, I don't use the word legalism. Okay, so there, there should be a moratorium. You can only use the word legalism once a year. <laughs> no, I'll be more generous. You can only use the word legalism once a month, but be very careful of the occasion on which you use it. Here is uh, here's a beautiful harmony. Both, half, both halves of this text are singing in harmony together. There is absolute grace. I have chosen you. This was none of your doing. It was not a synergistic cooperation on your part, but you are under obligation. There is duty. There is an ought. There is an obligation. Uh, specifically, of course, here, as Moses is working out what Paul would call grace reigning through righteousness, as he talks about it in the fifth chapter of Romans specifically, Abraham is to teach his children so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what He has promised. Isn't that interesting? That the way in which God fulfills His covenant word, the way God fulfills His covenant is through the obedience of Abraham, through the gracious, responsive obedience of Abraham to the grace of God in the gospel. Now, get the grammar right here. That, that imperative always comes after indicative. Abraham is to live out in moral obligation to the Lord his duties within the covenant because of who he now is, a covenant child, embraced by the grace of God and loved with everlasting love, led by grace, that love to know. And specifically, he is to teach his children. I find that uh, I find that both alarming and fearful and wonderful and extraordinary all at the same time. God's, God's covenant embracing 
embracing an obligation on the part of parents in rearing their children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And I, I'm fully aware that we have uh, Presbyterians and Baptists and Pado baptists and Credo baptists here, but, but all of us can agree on that. On the, on the moral obligation within our homes and within our families to, to train up our children in the way that they should go. Not that there is any guarantee that all of our children will be saved. That's not the way in which this text is put. This text is put in the form of a moral obligation that now resides upon those who have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. Grace obligates, and it is a joy, and it is not burdensome. It is the response of a heart that has come to life to beat again. Someone belonging to our church and uh, First Presbyterian Church, Columbia, you're right there somewhere. Uh, lots of them here uh, today. Uh, there was a little child uh, who fell into a pond, and uh, when the parents uh, ran out and pulled this little child, this happened uh, just a week, ten days ago, when this little child was pulled out of the pond, its heart had stopped beating. You can imagine the sense of panic uh, in uh, the parents, and uh, they did uh, they did some uh, CPR. They knew what to do, apparently. And uh, by the time the medics uh, arrived, there was that there was that hopeful, that hopeful sound and, and feeling that that heart had come back to life again, and was beating in in tune with that life. And just the same way as a, a regenerate heart in covenant with God, having, having experienced that life-giving energy having been born from above in a sovereign monogistic way, now, now beats in harmony and in love for God's moral obligations. Well, the obligation of the covenant Lord. Secondly, the moral integrity of the covenant Lord. The, the moral integrity of the covenant Lord. Go down to verses 20 and 21, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very great. I will go down and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me, and if not, I will, I will know. This is, this is part of… Uh, a continuing story in Genesis from the third chapter of Genesis. It's the continuing story that resulted in a, in a flood because of sin, because of violation, because of law-breaking. We'll see something of a, a climax in the slaughter of the Canaanites in Joshua chapter 10, and here the focus is on Sodom. And God is, God is saying, Moses is citing the Lord here as saying He will, he will go down and investigate. It's, it's, it's an anthropomorphic description of God going down into the city to see for Himself, to look into the nooks and crannies, to walk in the streets, to open doors, to go into places where no man should go, let alone God. There's a prolonged process here of investigation, and it's highlighting on the one hand the, the, the patience of God and the long-suffering of God, but it's, it's emphasizing on the other, the moral integrity of God. He will not do that which is contrary to law and fact. He's going to ascertain the fact. What are the facts here? 
Uh, we're all following it. The, the Malaysian, uh, the Malaysian triple seven. And where did it go? Like an episode from Lost. Staggering. What in what in the world happened? And uh, and uh, what are the facts? Because without the facts, you have conspiracies. And there have been some fascinating and weird and scary fantasy-like explanations. God is, God, is, uh, God is going to investigate what happens, what has happened in Sodom, and He's going to do it personally to underline His moral integrity, to, to, to raise to the surface what Abraham will deploy in his prayer, shall not the Lord of all the earth do right, do right, do justice. God never acts unjustly. This is a difficult passage. Thank you for assigning it to me. <laughs> I want to preach on John 3.16, and I get Sodom. It raises all kinds of uh, questions, doesn't it, about God and about God's character, about the holiness of God, about the righteousness of God, about the integrity of God, the justice of God the wrath of God. Okay, I say wrath, you say wrath. <laughs> just turn that page. I'm, I'm going to say wrath. I, can't, I just can't bring myself to say wrath. It, it's like wearing somebody else's clothes. <laughs> I did that as a teenager. I was a third son. I got hand-me-downs. I remember the day when I… When I took out my pocket money and went to the store and bought my own clothes. I, re I remember that day as a teenager. This is a problem to us, Sodom. God is uh, revealing to Abraham uh, what He intends to do, and what does He intend to do? He intends to destroy Sodom. So you can see it on, uh, on CNN or… Fox News, scenes of a city in flames, reaching up into the sky, smoke billowing, scene of utter devastation and destruction. And this is God's doing, and it will come to pass in the next chapter. In chapter 19, Sodom will be destroyed. What kind of God does that? It's the same issue. My child is sick and dying. My marriage is breaking up. This trial, this problem, this difficulty, where is God in all of this? It's an issue of uh, theodicy, justifying the ways of God to men, and, and we, we feel the need to, to justify this. Huh? What kind of God does this? It's the wrath of God revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who in their unrighteousness suppress the truth. It's the wrath of God. Now, does your Bible contain the word propitiation? I mean, your English Bible, does it, does it contain the word, the, the actual word propitiation? If your Bible doesn't contain the word propitiation, fold it, put it away, get yourself another Bible. 
There is no English word that can translate what is essential to that Hellasmos Greek word group than the word propitiation, because propitiation means, means the wrath of God is fully spent. C.H. Dodd, in the original revised uh, standard version, uh, removed the word propitiation uh, from uh, the Bible and uh, spoke eloquently and wrote uh, eloquently. We're talking the 1930s and the 1940s. C.H. Uh, Dodd said that the wrath of God is impersonal, meaning that uh, bad things are in themselves the wrath of God, but, but, but God Himself is not wrathful. Well, that issue, of course, has not gone away. You saw it uh, last year uh, with uh, Keith Getty and uh, Stuart Townend's uh, hymn, uh, In Christ Alone. And uh, that hymn was to be included uh, within uh, a hymnal that was uh, published uh, last year, I think in October of last year, uh, except that uh, that hymn contains uh, th those lines. I think it's the second verse of In Christ Alone, the wrath of God was satisfied. And uh, they wanted to change that because uh, apparently a Baptist hymnal already existed with a changed version, without permission, let, let it be added, uh, a changed version of In Christ Alone had inserted that the love of God was magnified instead of the wrath of God was satisfied. And all, uh, all kudos and strength to Keith Getty and uh, Stuart Townend for sticking to their theological principles and insisting that uh, those words should be in any version of the hymn that was printed and sung, that the wrath of God is satisfied. Satisfaction, it's a theological term. It's not a biblical term, but it's a theological term. Uh, that comes from Anselm of uh, Canterbury in the 12th uh, century, that the wrath of God, the anger of God, God is just, and He's angry with sin, and sin needs to be punished, and, and for sin to be covered, and for sin to be, to be, to be forgiven. That, that wrath needs to be spent somehow, some way. It needs to be satisfied. Our uh, Westminster divines uh, speak of uh, the atonement in uh, chapter 8 of the Confession uh, in terms of God, uh, that, the, that the justice of God is satisfied, the satisfaction of divine justice. Well, that's what we see here. That's the issue, the wrath of God towards sin. Oh, there are those uh, who say that we live in a society that doesn't understand the concept of law, and that's true. That we have a low view of sin as a consequence, and that is true. Sin is, um, well, sin is like a parking ticket. I was uh, welcoming someone into Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, he, had, he had just arrived and uh, uh, was engaged in a ministry uh, somewhere else in the city, and I, I met with him for coffee, parked the car. We have meters in Columbia and uh, efficient meter readers, <laughs> and uh, I was, uh, I was uh, sitting by a window, and I was engaged in conversation, and uh, the conversation had taken a certain track that had intrigued me. And, uh, we, were, we were engaged in this conversation to a degree that was fairly intense at one point, and, uh, and then all of a sudden, in the corner of my eye, I spied her. <laughs> Dressed in black, she was walking around my car. And then I saw it, this, this electronic gizmo thing in her hand. I was out of that coffee shop in a, in a, in a flash. 
didn't finish my, my sentence. I just left without explanation. She let me off. So that I can tell you today, I have never had a parking ticket. <laughs> I, I don't know what that makes me, but I have never had a parking ticket. Now, supposing I had, which would make a better illustration. How much grief do you give over a parking ticket? Well, I mean, it's an inconvenience. But I guarantee you that most of you speak about a parking ticket, which is a violation of law, you understand. And Christians should be law keepers like me. <laughs> I guarantee you when you have a parking ticket in, in, a, in a party or in a gathering of some kind, you have boasted about it. Oh, I got a parking ticket. You wrote the check, put it in the mail. Nothing pleasurable about that, of course, but there was no sense of guilt. You weren't weighed down with an enormous sense of guilt that you had broken the law. Sin is any want of conformity or transgression of the law of God. And you say, well, parking tickets are not the law of God. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's, Jesus says. You don't play one off against the other, by the way, that you don't have to render to Caesar because the important thing is rendering to God. No, you render to Caesar what is Caesar's. You pay your taxes. It's that time of year. The reason we find this passage difficult is because we have such a low view of sin. We have such a low view of sin. Now, let me move on, because there's a third thing here. Not only do we see the obligations that are derived from the covenant Lord and the integrity of the covenant Lord, but we see, thirdly, the approachability of the covenant Lord. And in verse 22, the three visitors uh, it's not the Trinity. Two of them go off to Sodom, and then we read, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. And then it starts, then it begins, this extraordinary prayer, this uh, prayer which is uh, well, what is it? It's a, it's a bartering, it's a haggling, it's a, a, an exploring of His relationship with God. It's all of those things, for sure. But notice what He doesn't do, that because God is absolutely sovereign, because nothing happens without God willing it to happen, without God willing it to happen before it happens, without God willing it to happen in the way that it happens, Abraham does not conclude, there is no point in me doing anything. There is no point in me praying. If God is sovereign, why pray? Abraham doesn't have that uh, debate uh, within his mind. He doesn't engage in that kind of philosophical reasoning that uh, is a deduction from some view of God that is perhaps essentially deterministic, and therefore obligation on my part or my engagement in prayer and, 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 and soliciting God and asking God and begging God that His… That his secret will and revealed will might come into harmony with Abraham's will. Notice the boldness, the boldness. Fifty. Now, let's be clear here. Abraham isn't praying, Lord, spare the righteous. That's not his prayer. In one sense, if God were to judge Sodom and the righteous were to be taken with it, they would be safe in the arms of Jesus. 
Abraham isn't praying here some kind of health and wealth, name it and claim it, gab it and grab it kind of prayer. That somehow or other the righteous don't deserve to be tried and tested and experience pain and, and, and deprivation. No, that's not the prayer. The burden of his heart here is for Sodom. It's for the city. Because Abraham understands that the way that the promise of the covenant that the nations of the world will be blessed in him begins with the cities that immediately surround him. You know, it's easy to be concerned about stuff that's on the other side of the world. Oh, it's a lot easier to do a one-week mission trip to somewhere on the other side of the world than it is to do a mission trip across the street in your own city and in your own backyard. This is Abraham's backyard, and his heart is, is full, and with boldness he enters into this prayer. Spare the city if there are, if there are 50 or 45 or 40 or 30 or 20 or 10. Thomas Watson says, and I think he was quoting an early church father, and it may have been one of the Cyrils, but my memory escapes me. But he said, when you, when you pray, you ought to make God ashamed if He doesn't grant what you're asking. Now, that's praying. That's praying that we ought to so shape our petitions in a way that would make God ashamed if He did not grant what it is that we ask. He's not, he's not praying here that the righteous would be spared. Too much of our praying ends up like that, doesn't it? Our prayer meetings become organ recitals you know, hearts and spleens and livers and kidneys about the Lord's people. And I'm not saying that those are not important things to pray for, but there are more things to pray for. And frankly, at times there are more urgent things to pray for. The cities of the world heading for destruction. And what's… why did Abraham stop at ten? 50, 45, 40, 30, 20, 10. Why did he stop at 10? Why didn't he go down all the way to 1? Uh, lot was there, whatever you make of Lot, how righteous Lot was, I don't know, but he was a member of the tribe of Abraham. Whether he should have taken Lot is a, an open question, got him into all kinds of trouble. Why did he stop at 10? And the only answer, it seems to me, that makes sense as to why he stops at 10 is because 10 was the required number for a synagogue. To have a synagogue, you needed to have 10. That, that seems to be what Moses is now reflecting, and Moses is writing this after the fact. And he's reminding the, the people of God of the significance of 10. Ten righteous people, ten who profess faith, ten who are in covenant with the Lord. And if God can find ten, a synagogue, He'll spare the city. If God can find a church, Hope my hermeneutic from synagogue to church hasn't bent you out of shape now, but if God can find a church in Sodom, ten people, He'll spare the city. I'm thinking of writing a book called The Power of Ten. The Power of Ten. Do you know what this passage is teaching? It's teaching many things. 
and it's entirely countercultural. This passage is entirely countercultural. We're talking about the wrath of God against the city. What is it that spares this city? The church. The presence of the church. My dear friends, now I know the city wasn't spared because there weren't ten people there. That's not the point. Do you know, among other things, this passage is teaching the significance of the church in God's program for saving the world. I will build my church. Ligonier Ministries exist to strengthen the church. Churches are so much stronger for the ministry of, uh, of uh, Dr. Sproul and the ministry of, uh, of Ligonier Ministries. It's an arm to strengthen the main program here. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Who are these people? And I, and I meet them who say, um, you know, I have no time for the church. You know, the church has hurt me or whatever. Who hasn't been hurt by the church? The King James was right. Ye are a peculiar people. (laughs) My dear friend, and I mean this in all seriousness, if you have no time for the church, then God has no time for you. If you have no time for the church, God has no time for you. At the heart of the redemptive purposes of Jesus Christ in the gospel are those words, I will build my church. This is… this is deeply significant, and I have to bring this to a close. You know, Sodom is a warning. It's a warning throughout the Scriptures. It's a warning in 2 Peter. Second Peter reflects on Sodom, and he he says it's like a little glimpse of the day of judgment. It's a little glimpse of the day of judgment, and we find… How many of us here find the idea of God destroying the city of Sodom an utterly repulsive thing? My dear friends, the destruction of Sodom is not the problem. The destruction of Sodom is perfectly understandable, and it was perfectly just. Why did the wrath of God alight on the immaculate, sinless, Jesus on the cross. That's the problem. When Jesus cried, my God, my God, not my Father, as though His awareness and assurance of His native sonship had been obliterated because God made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin. The curse of God had descended upon him. And in the darkness and seeming despair of Calvary, the question, the moral question arises, why does the wrath of God alight here? There are only two answers. How is it right for the wrath of God to alight upon His sinless Son? Here's one answer that the universe is not fair, that God is not fair, and you have to suck it up and move on. That's one answer. And here's another, because at the point at which the wrath of God came down upon His Son, it was the right thing to do because our sins had been reckoned to His account. 
And at that point, as Luther says, he was the greatest sinner the world has ever seen. And God judged him and drove him from his presence. No, my friend, Sodom is not the problem. We understand Sodom. It's what sin deserves. It's Calvary that's the problem. It's the wrath of God coming down upon His Son that is the problem. And the greatest solution the universe has ever seen to the problem of sin. Father, we, we thank You. Thank You for this passage as we reflect on it together. There's so many features of it that balk at contemporary society and worldview. And we pray for a holy belligerence to be steadfast to the Word of God and what is written and to Your holy character that we see so, so eloquently in the cross. So bless Your Word to us and help us as a church in a dark place, in a world that is heading for destruction that the church might be a salting influence and a light and a beacon that shines to the truth of the gospel in the darkened cities of this world. And we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen.